Well, good morning, Hope Chapel family. It's wonderful to be with you again. I'm excited to open up the Word together this morning. For those of you who might be visiting with us for the first time uh, on our stream, my name is Mike, and I have the great privilege of serving as one of our teaching pastors here at Hope. Okay, church, I have a serious message for you this morning. The Lord, the Lord has a serious message for us this morning. And I just want to say up front that um, I had to preach this message to myself um, before I could come and preach it to you. So I just ask that you would open your hearts and open your minds. Uh, and uh, I'm excited about what the Lord has to say to us this morning. So I'm going to be speaking to us from Matthew chapter 16, verses 24 through 28. So wherever you're at, please open your Bibles, open your apps, turn to, scroll to Matthew chapter 16, and read along with me um, what the word of the Lord says. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return from his soul? For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels in the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each one according to what he has done. Truly, I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Church, this is the word of the Lord. <clears throat> I want to begin by asking you a question. Have you ever looked at a picture of yourself, maybe a recent picture, maybe an old picture, and then you immediately thought, wait, who is that person? Is that me? Maybe the next thought is, oh my, what was I thinking? I think we've all had this kind of experience. I think we can all relate. Um, maybe you look at that picture and you realize that you don't look quite like you thought you did at the time the picture was taken. Maybe you realize that your outfit needed a little bit of work, or maybe you realize that uh, you were a little bit out of shape. Sometimes the words of Jesus are like this for us. Uh, we look into his words and the reflection that comes back to us is unsettling. Uh, I think this is ultimately a good thing. It's not a bad thing because his words show us where our perspective is skewed from reality. Over the past several weeks, we have been considering some of Jesus' strongest words, some of his hard sayings about discipleship. I think the Lord has put a burden on my heart I think he's put a burden on Andrew's heart and he's put a burden on Zach's heart for us to go through a time of serious self-examination as a church and as individual believers. This is a new year and this new year brings with it opportunity for new examination and renewed prioritization. Today, we're going to consider more of Jesus' words about discipleship but not about making disciples, instead about being disciples. This is a text about the cost of discipleship. <clears throat> now, our passage this morning is really the conclusion of a narrative sequence that begins all the way back in verse 13. So I want to take some time up front here and walk through the context together to get a sense of the whole scene. Then we'll come back to um, our immediate text. So if we look back to verse 13, this is what Matthew records. Now, when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, who do people say that the son of man is? So these events unfold in a location called Caesarea Philippi. It was a city about 30 miles north of the Sea of Galilee. In the ancient land, Jerusalem was in the south, Galilee was in the north, and so this is north of Galilee. Now, Matthew, Mark, and Luke each recount um, this pivotal moment in Jesus' ministry. In many ways, this is a watershed moment. Uh, this event at Caesarea Philippi represents the turning point in the gospel narrative as Jesus concludes his Galilean ministry in the north, and he sets his faith face south towards Jerusalem, where he's going to suffer and die. 
But before he begins his final journey, before he begins the final phase of his mission, Jesus uses this occasion to confront his disciples' limited understanding of who he is and what he has come to do and therefore what it really means to follow him. We need to see that what Jesus was doing with his disciples then, he still does with us as his disciples today. That's why this passage is included in every one of the three synoptic gospels, because people are always misunderstanding Jesus. People are always misunderstanding Jesus' person, who he is, and Jesus' work what he did. We can't truly follow him if we don't have total, absolute conviction and clarity on these two points. And people make all kinds of claims about Jesus today. I hear them all the time. Oh, Jesus is a great moral teacher. Or Jesus was a prophet. Or Jesus is a spiritual guru. Jesus is one way to God. Or Jesus is this. Jesus is that. Well, things are really no different today than they were then. Je- Jesus Jesus said to his disciples, who do the people say the son of man is? He put the question to his disciples. And what do they say in verse 14? And they said, some say John the Baptist. Others say Elijah. And others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. So the people clearly don't understand. They they might might be like Nicodemus was in John 3 that that, that comes to Jesus and says, hey, we we know that you're from God because nobody could do these things unless God is with him. But the people don't see Jesus fully. So next, uh, Jesus puts the question directly to the disciples. He he tests their understanding of who he is. And in verse 15, he says to them, but who do you? Who do you say that I am? And of course, Peter answers for all of them in verse 16. Simon Peter replied, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And there it is. Um, Peter sees Jesus. God has revealed it to him. He sees who Jesus really is. And so he confesses rightly Jesus' true identity. Now, um, before before we go any further, um, I want to point out that the Bible only records Jesus traveling to Caesarea Philippi on this one occasion. This is it. So why would Jesus intentionally take a 14 walk hour walk with his disciples um, a 30 mile journey out of his way north of Galilee where most of his ministry had taken place to this point and even further from Jerusalem where where he's about to turn his attention and journey to there's two things that we need to know about this place the first is that Caesar Augustus gave Caesarea Philippi to Herod the Great in 20 BC so the emperor gave this city to Herod, the same Herod that sought to kill baby Jesus um, in 20 BC. The city used to be named Panaeus, um, but it was renamed Caesarea Philippi by Herod's son Philip in 3 BC in honor of Caesar Augustus. The city housed a temple that was built and dedicated to the worship of the emperor to Caesar. So for the locals and for the Jews, this city represented not only Roman oppression, but also emperor worship. Now, second, this ancient city was built on and and against a towering, majestic rock formation. Uh, I've been there. I've seen it. It's something to behold. And Caesar's temple was situated above this rock formation. But the city was formerly named Panaeus because it housed in this rock formation a naturally occurring cave and spring that had been dedicated to the Greek god Pan. And tradition, legend had held that Pan was one of the few gods in their pantheon of gods who could actually cross into hell, cross into Hades, and then return back to earth. So as a result, this cave was recognized as the gate of Hades, the realm of the dead, the underworld. It was recognized as the gateway to hell. So Jesus brings his disciples out of the way, 30 miles, 14 hours north here to Caesarea Philippi as the backdrop against which he'll have the most important conversation with his disciples where he will begin to reveal to them uh, more fully, not just who he is, but what he has come 
to do. Because Jesus has not just come to stop the threat of the emperor. That wouldn't be enough. He's also come to conquer the powers of hell and death, which are represented by this very location. So Peter confesses rightly, you, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And now with this giant rock formation serving as both the geographic and religious backdrop, Jesus responds to Peter in verse 17. And Jesus answered him, blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I tell you, you are Peter, which means rock. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Jesus says, yes, Simon, you see me and now you will be my rock. I will build my church, not on this rock, but on top of you and your confession and the emperor will not prevail over my church. And what Jesus is revealing is even so much greater than what Peter can even imagine. Because Jesus is saying, not even the gates of hell will prevail over my church. Death itself will not prevail, will not be able to hold my church. And I will give you the keys to this kingdom, Peter, my rock. I'm going to do something that goes so unfathomably beyond political liberation. My kingdom is going to be so unfathomably greater that not even the gates of hell, not even death itself will stand a chance. I think Peter's mind must have been blown. He's standing in front of Pan's rock Uh, over which Caesar's temple looms. Can you imagine how fired up he must have been in that moment? He's rightly confessed who Jesus is. Jesus says all this stuff. Peter's like, I'm going to be the rock. What? Like, let's go, Jesus. You're the one. I knew it. Let's do this thing. Let's go to Jerusalem. We'll put a crown on your head. We'll coronate you king. We'll enthrone you in the temple. We'll all drive out Rome. Let's go. So Peter sees who Jesus is. But does he see what Jesus has come to do? What does Matthew record next in verse 21? From that time, Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed. And on the third day, be raised. You see, Jesus didn't come to go over Rome, but to go under it. His way is not the way of domination, but the way of death. Peter, on the other hand, has a very different idea of what Jesus has come to do. Look at verse 22. And Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord, this shall never happen to you. I love looking at Peter and, and, and listening to his words here, uh, he had this uncanny ability to put two words together in a statement that should never be joined and offered to the Lord. No, Lord. No, Lord. This will never happen. What does Jesus say in response? Verse 23. But Jesus turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God but on the things of man. So in just a few seconds, in the amount of time it took Peter to utter these two short sentences, his stock plummets, it crashes through the floor. We need to acknowledge that Peter's words are sincere. He believes in Jesus. His words are hopeful. They're well-intended, but they're profoundly misguided. Why? Because Peter confessed Christ's person, but he denied Christ's work. Peter wanted Jesus on his terms. 
He wanted the Christ that would fulfill his expectations. The Christ of political conquest. The Christ of military might. The Christ who would set up the world that he had hoped and longed for. That would give to him the life that he wanted. But Jesus says, there are only two ways. My way or Satan's way. The narrow road or the broad road. The hard road or the easy road. You see, we need to embrace both Jesus' person and his work. If we embrace who he is, but we don't embrace what he did and therefore what he calls us to, then we are sunk. We have to embrace both. Jesus demands that we set our eyes on the things of God, not on the things of man. Jesus says, God's people serve God. God's interests. And as Jesus now looks ahead towards his passion, as he sets his face to Jerusalem, he imparts three words to his disciples. He gives them a word of command. He gives them a word of caution. And he gives them a word about his second coming. So first, Uh, Look with me at Christ's command. Verse 24, the first verse of our text this morning. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Jesus' words here flow straight out of Peter's failure. Jesus uses Peter's failure um, as the occasion to make clear what discipleship to him must be. Note that Jesus says, if anyone would come after me. That's a smooth translation in our English text. But if we kind of peek behind the curtain, we see the original Greek word thelo, which means I desire or I want or I wish or I will. So this is something like he sets his will. If anyone sets his will on coming after me. Nobody becomes a follower of Jesus by kind of drifting into it. I do a lot of premarital counseling as a pastor here. And I love hearing the stories of how couples end up together. Uh, I hear things like this. Well, we met through mutual friends and, you know, we hung out a few times and then it just kind of happened. I hear that a lot. Listen, people might happen to get together, but no one accidentally has a wedding day. That doesn't just come together. Uh, It takes a personal decision, an accounting of the cost expressed through a formal proposal. It takes money, planning, time, vows, and tremendous commitment to end up at a wedding day. There's this thing. Here's the thing about being a disciple of Jesus. It doesn't just kind of happen. Uh, There must always be a wholehearted decision, accounting of the cost, and an explicit and resolved setting of the will, a choice. If anyone sets his will on coming after me, Jesus says. And Jesus follows this statement with a series of imperatives, a series of three commands. This is what it must be. If we ever think, church, that we can come to Jesus on our terms, then we need to reread these verses. We can't come to Jesus on our terms. We can only come to him on his terms. He defines the terms of the arrangement. We don't dictate the conditions of the arrangement. He dictates the conditions of the arrangement. So the words that follow here aren't Jesus' suggestions. They aren't even his requests. They're his demands. This is what it must be. If I'm to be a disciple of Jesus, if I'm to be a Christian, then I must count the cost and I must choose to joyfully submit to his demands. 
if I do not count the cost, if I do not make this choice, if I do not submit to his demands, then I have no business calling myself his disciple. He certainly will not. So what does Jesus demand of me? If I'm going to be his disciple, Jesus demands three things. He demands that I deny, that I carry, and that I follow. That I deny, that I carry, and I follow. <clears throat> First, Jesus demands that I deny myself. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. In other words, my choice to come after Jesus has to include the choice to deny myself. Self-denial is not some kind of next step in following Jesus somewhere down the road. Because he calls me to begin coming after him by entering through the narrow gate and walking on the narrow road, on the costly road, on the hard road. I remember when I was younger and in high school, I wanted more than anything to play uh, basketball at the highest competitive level um, as a high school athlete. <clears throat> and so... The summer between my sophomore and junior years of high school, um, I transferred from a Division three school to a Division I school, um, leaving two years of high school relationships behind, leaving another team and a program behind. I gave up all forms of summer recreation that would be desirable to a 16, 17-year-old kid in the South Bay to, to live in a stinky, sweaty gym and to train my body and to hone my basketball skills. I changed my diet. I changed my sleeping habits. I paid my dues. I submitted my life to a personal trainer who kicked my butt every single day. He ran me up and down Sand Dune Park in Manhattan Beach till I puked all the time. It required discipline. It required sacrifice. Everything else became subordinate to that one overriding purpose. I had to deny myself. Now, I may not have a comprehensive understanding of all the self-denial that Jesus will call me to as I follow him. But at a minimum, I'm swearing my ultimate allegiance to him. And I am preemptively renouncing my right to myself, to my life as I would have it. And to all those things which he will raise to my awareness in the future and say, you will give this up for me. There's no single thing in my heart that I can reserve my right to and say, Jesus, you can have everything except for this. No. If anyone would come after me, let him deny himself. We could just stop right here in a great many professing Christians in our culture and in our country who have never denied themselves anything for the sake of Christ would immediately be disqualified as his disciples. What about you? What about you? Church, we must not be self-deceived. Jesus warns us about it. The key to discipleship is self-denial. And Jesus is the original. He is the OG who surrendered himself up to death. Uh, to follow him as God demands is to renounce from the very beginning the centrality of self. Second, Jesus demands that I carry my cross. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross. In the first demand, I'm called to deny things in my life. In the second demand, I am called to deny my life. <clears throat> now we read, Jesus' words here, knowing that eventually hung on the cross. And so the mention of cross seems to blur together. But the degree to which the, this very idea would have been utterly scandalous and incomprehensible to Peter and his disciples is completely lost on us. They're hearing Jesus and they're thinking, pick up my cross? What? I thought we were about to conquer. 
not carry a cross. <clears throat> Carrying a cross means that your life has been determined by an authority greater than yourself. It means a verdict has been rendered over your life. It means that your life is coming to an end. A man carrying a cross is a dead man walking. For us to take up our cross means at least these things. But it also means more. You see, the force of Jesus' demand here, take up your cross, is lost on us as modern readers because we have been completely desensitized to the horror of crucifixion. We have been desensitized because the cross has become a cultural symbol. People wear crosses as pieces of jewelry. They adorn themselves with crosses. Um, it's become the de facto symbol of Christianity the cross has. It's become like this thing that has a positive visual connotation, at least for most of us. And that's because none of us has ever personally witnessed a crucifixion. <clears throat> the Romans, on the other hand, regarded the cross as the most cruel and the most disgusting form of punishment, dehumanizing. You would choose to be burned alive or fed to beasts or decapitated before you chose to be crucified. It was the ultimate punishment. It was without question the last death a man would choose. It was brutal. It was painful. It was public. It was slow. It was a spectacle. It was the worst, and it was reserved for the worst people. For Jews, it was the worst curse to hang on a cross. And we trivialize Jesus' words today when we say things like, oh, it's just my cross to bear. Oh, I just need to deny myself. Oh, I just need to pick up my cross. We need to know <laughs> that Jesus' words here are about literal death. They are about following the condemned man on his way to execution. In other words, dis discipleship to Jesus is a life of at least potential martyrdom with him. And I know what all of you are thinking right now. There, yes, there, there is a sense in which we can draw out of this principle the less perilous demand to prioritize loyalty to Jesus before our comforts and pursuits and all that. But we need to see that this kind of generalization is at best secondary. Jesus' words are not to be taken here as merely metaphorical. If anyone would come after me, let him take up his cross. If I'm to be his disciple, then I must fully identify with him, even to the point of being willing to die as he did. Christians in America like to talk a lot about being persecuted for their faith or if necessary, you know, potentially dying for their faith. But if we haven't given up sexualized entertainment, self-serving accumulation of material wealth, gossip and malice, anger, bitterness, petty divisions in the church, spiritual laziness personally, what in the world makes us think that we would give up our lives. <clears throat> Third, Jesus demands that I follow him. Jesus said, if anyone would come after me, let him follow me. Now, I just want to kind of state the obvious here. When Jesus demands that I take up my cross and then demands that I follow him, the implication is that I don't put my cross down. When I deny myself, I empty my hands. When I take up my cross, I cling with those hands to the crude instrument that he did with his hands. My life is not my own anymore. 
My life takes a cruciform shape. It follows a cruciform path. It takes me to a cruciform end. Where he calls, I follow. Where he goes, I go. His cross is my cross. His road is my road. His end is my end. And it is my joy to follow him there. This is not a perspective of the disciple. This is the perspective of the disciple. Furthermore, when Jesus says, let him follow me, the grammar conveys an ongoing, continuous, unending action. We don't follow him for a moment. We don't follow him for a short spurt. We don't follow him for a week, for a month, for a year or two. We don't follow him for a season. We follow him forever until he calls us home. Jesus says, for whoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Church, following Jesus means conflict with ease and comfort. It means going to battle with ease and comfort. And it means following him into suffering and hardships. Next, look with me at Christ's caution. Verse 26, Jesus uh, next gives his disciples a word of warning. He says in verse 26, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? The first thing we see in these rhetorical questions of Jesus is that he demands a reversal of perspective. Jesus demands a reversal of perspective. Now, if you think about it, no one can have everything. Think of some people today who, quote unquote, have it all. Money, power, influence, celebrity, fame, everything that the world seems to offer, they seem to have it. People like Jeff Bezos, Elon Musk, Warren Buffett, Bill Gates, top of the financial food chain. And yet with as much as they have, they still don't have the whole world. Jesus says, you can have everything, the whole world, but it will cost you eternity. And his rhetorical question here is, is it worth it? Jesus' point is, you can live now and die later, or you can die now and live later. We live in a culture where long-term investing is almost axiomatic. It's, the, it's rule number one of personal finance. We all understand, uh, save, invest in it for the long haul. And yet so many people embrace this wisdom with respect to their money, but they spurn it when it comes from Jesus with respect to their souls. It is true that in following Jesus, we stand to lose this short life. And it is short. James, the half-brother of Jesus, writes um, in his uh, little letter that, uh, What is your life? For you are a mist that appears for a little time. And then it vanishes. So we stand to lose our short life, but we stand to gain eternity. Jesus told Peter that the gates of hell would not prevail over his church. That means that the gates of hell will not be able to hold the community of believers that are built on 
Peter in his confession, the people who forsake all to answer Jesus' call, the great multitude throughout history who receive the gospel freely and give everything for it in response. Jesus demands a complete change of perspective. Rather than living with my eyes fixed on the here and now, I have to live with my eyes fixed on eternity. Jonathan Edwards, the great Puritan preacher and thinker and writer, once exclaimed, Lord, stamp eternity on my eyeballs. Have you ever looked momentarily at a, at a bright image or, or a light or the sun and then looked away and you see an after image. Edwards is saying here that, that looking uh, at eternity needs to be like looking at a brilliant image that leaves a lasting after image. What if that after image were of our glorious future with Christ of eternity? And what if it never faded from our field of view? Would your life take on a different shape? Perhaps a more cruciform shape. But next, in these rhetorical questions, Jesus also promises a reversal of fortune. He's saying the one who forfeits everything to follow him now will receive an eternal reward. But the one who forfeits him now to seek everything will receive an eternal punishment. There are only two options, Jesus says. I sometimes wonder if right now we are living through the hardest period of church history yet. I know that that seems counterintuitive to you as you hear my words, but here's what I mean. Never has there been a period of such unprecedented peace and prosperity for Jesus's followers. Relative to church history, it costs us almost nothing to claim his name. So let me ask you, when was the last time you legitimately suffered for the name of Jesus? Most of us can live our comfortable middle-class existence without much interference in the way of suffering and persecution, not real persecution. So I want to ask you, us, myself included, a hard question. This is a question I've been wrestling with all week as I labored over this text, and this text labored over me. This is a question that Jesus is asking each of us today. When it costs me so little to claim Christ in this culture, how can I be certain that I am truly his disciple? How can I be certain that I have truly been following him at all? Last weekend, Pastor Andrew spoke to us from Jesus, the conclusion of Jesus' Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 7, where Jesus says that many on the day of judgment will come to him and say, Lord, Lord, did we not do all these miraculous things in your name? Jesus says, I will, to say, I will say to them on that day, depart from me, you workers of lawlessness. I never knew you. And he's saying all these things to his disciples. Church, this is gut check time. This text brings us into a gut check time. We need to take this passage personally. We need to understand that Jesus is laying it down in this passage. We easily mistake Jesus for some kind of soft savior who will just kind of understand, who will, you know, just be cool in the end. But here's the negative formulation of what Jesus is saying in this text. If you aren't willing to deny yourself, don't come. If you aren't willing to take up your cross, don't come. If you aren't willing to follow me through Calvary, through death, don't come. 
if you insist on holding on to this life, don't come. If I'm just a, an appendage of your life, a compartment in your life, if I am not your whole life, don't come. Truth be told, most of us are really more like Peter than we care to admit or even see. Peter, who put together those two words, no, Lord. Oh, I'll come after you, Jesus, but I'm taking this thing with me. No, Lord, I'm not giving up that thing. No, Lord, I'm not giving up that relationship. No, Lord, I'm not giving up that ambition. No, Lord, I'm not surrendering that pleasure. No, Lord, I'm not giving up this little God. No, Lord. Jesus won't accept this from us. We can't accept Christ's person and deny Christ's work by saying no to the narrow road that he has called us to. Now, I want to be clear about something. I have no doubt in my mind that some of you are offended right now. Good. Good. I hope that by the grace of God, you can channel that offense into fruitful self-examination. Because I would rather offend some of you as a means of provoking examination than never call you to such uncomfortable examination and to find out one day that you are in fact in hell forever. Because I'm not some kind of cheap salesman just trying to get you to attend more services so that I can keep collecting your tithe all the while, making it as comfortable and convenient and non-confrontational as possible, you know, so we can keep our attendance up and keep you paying up and keep the ship growing and getting bigger. Selling you a bill of goods that says the road with Jesus is just a walk in the park. Well, that's not what we do here at this church. We don't declare to you peace, peace, when there is no peace or declare to you grace, grace, if you're not actually under his grace. Jesus is saying, if you will only come a quarter of the way or halfway or three quarters of the way or nine tenths of the way or 99 hundredths of the way, then don't come at all. Because until his kingdom reality outweighs every consideration, even your own life, you are not a true follower. Church, these words are for us. Not our unsaved aunts and uncles, not our unbelieving neighbor, not our nominally believing friends. Don't text me after the service and say, oh, Mike, I love this sermon. I wish my friend had heard it. These words are for you. These words are for me. They're for us. Jesus was speaking to his disciples, to his inner circle, to the 12. These are the guys who have been with him. They're the ones who have heard his teaching up close and personal, who were there, who witnessed the Sermon on the Mount, perhaps the greatest sermon, greatest teaching ever recorded in human history. They still didn't fully get it. They've been with him for miracles. They've watched him command the sea, make something out of nothing and, and divide fishes and loaves and feed multitudes and raise the dead. And all these things, they've seen Jesus do everything. And they still miss some things. And we are more like them in their frailty and in their faults and in their failure than we are even equipped to realize, let alone acknowledge. Many of us won't lose a job for Jesus, let alone our life for Jesus. Many of us won't die to ourselves 
in our marriages for Jesus, let alone die for Jesus. Many of us won't deny our compulsions for Jesus, let alone deny our whole selves for Jesus. Many of us won't sacrifice our time to be with Jesus, let alone sacrifice our whole life for Jesus. Many of us won't give Jesus' own money, which he has entrusted to us as stewards, back to Jesus, let alone give up everything for Jesus. Jesus says, For what will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Jesus concludes this hard teaching with a final word, and it's a word about his second coming. Look with me at verses 27 through 28. We're going to focus on verse 27. For the Son of Man is going to come with his angels and the glory of his Father, and then he will repay each person according to what he has done. Truly I say to you, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. I could say so much about Jesus' closing words, um, but I really want to highlight just one essential, central truth that Jesus is conveying here that we need to cling to with everything in our souls. Church, he is worth it. He is worth it. There is not one sacrifice, one instance of self-denial, one loss for his sake that he will not remember, fully reward, and repay 10 million times over in the life to come. There's not one part of this life that though we are tempted to hold on to it, to cling to it, that when we put it down to pick up our cross, Jesus will not repay 100 million times over in eternity. We need to remember that Jesus is king. Jesus is king. And while he presently reigns from his heavenly throne, where he is where he's seated at the right hand of the Father, he is currently preparing his way back to us. His road here was hard ignominious. It was full of suffering. It wasn't sexy. His road back will be triumphant and it will be full of glory. He calls us right now to walk his hard road. But when he comes back for us, we will walk forever with him in triumph and in glory. He is worth it. His kingdom is worth it. He says, I will repay each person according to what he has done. You see, he has promised. He has promised. And this doesn't mean that we're saved by works. We're saved by grace. Peter didn't deserve Jesus' favor. Jesus didn't cast Peter away for his failure. He did rebuke him in the strongest possible terms for his own welfare. No, Jesus kept Peter. He used Peter just as he promised he would. He kept his promise. We're saved by grace. It's unmerited favor and kindness. We don't deserve it, but it is freely given. But out of grace, we are calling to good works. This is a strange paradox of the Christian life. Salvation costs us nothing, but it costs us everything. You can't earn your way into heaven, but the road to it, the one that Jesus has made possible, the one he has called us to, the one that he has gone before us and successfully walked will only allow you to bring one thing, and that is your cross. And you can only pick up your cross because he laid down his life first. When you come to him, he receives you as you are, he offers you forgiveness, pardon, cleansing. But after he receives you, after he pardons you, after he cleanses you, he sets you on his costly way. I want to close with just a couple of remarks. 
There are so many important lessons to learn from this passage. Here's just a, a, sh a short handful. First, this passage tells us that we have to choose. We have to choose. We cannot worship false gods and Caesar and Rome and Jesus. We can't worship sensuality and Jesus. We can't worship material things and Jesus. We can't worship being liked and Jesus. We can't worship our career and Jesus. We can't worship our image and Jesus. It's everything or him. It's him or everything. Second, like Peter, we are called to public confession of Jesus' name, of what God has revealed to us, just as he revealed to Peter. We're called to public confession. Third, we will constantly be prone to the comfortable error of Peter and also of the Pharisees uh, who looked for a Messiah, who looked for um, a leader that would fit their preconceptions and, and who, would, who would meet them on their terms. We need to resist them to this temptation. We need to come after Jesus as he is. We can't have his person if we deny his work. Fourth, if we're to follow Jesus, we need to recognize that our entire lives will be a spiritual battle. We will always, always, always face the temptation to take the easy path. And that is always the path of the enemy. Fifth, it will always be costly to truly follow Jesus. You are not the exception to that rule. It will mean suffering. It will mean sacrifice. It will mean taking up the cross. It will mean losing our lives. But as Jesus has said, that is the, that the only way to truly find our lives. And finally, <clears throat> who has the right to demand all of this of us. Jesus has the right to demand it because he's not just some leader. He's the Lord of heaven and earth. He's the one who was raised from death. He's not some kind of guru. He's God in the flesh. He's the one who has gone before us and he calls us on the way that he himself first walked. So I leave you with this plea. Lose your life for Jesus. Let go of comfort. Let go of ease. Deny yourself. Carry your cross. And follow him. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word which divides bone from marrow, which, which penetrates and touches the deepest recesses of our hearts. Lord, we ask that you would have your way in our hearts, that you would surgically remove those parts of our heart that, that are holding out, that are not submitted to the Son. Grant us repentance where we need it. Grant us faith where we need more. Cause us to be your people who are about your purposes.